Speaker, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. Our invocation is by Susan Ducat, the Baha'i Faith Community. This prayer is from the writings of the Baha'i Faith. O Thou Almighty, we are Thy servants and Thy poor ones. We are remote and yearn for Thy presence. Our thirst for the water of Thy fountain are ill, longing for Thy healing. We are walking in Thy path and have no aim or hope save the diffusion of Thy fragrance so that all souls may raise the cry of, O oh God, guide us to the straight path. May their eyes be opened to behold the light, and may they be freed from the darkness of ignorance. May they gather round the lamp of thy guidance. May every portionless one receive a share. May the deprived become the confidants of thy mysteries. O oh Almighty, look upon us with a glance of mercifulness. Grant us heavenly confirmation. Bestow upon us the breath of the Holy Spirit, so that we may be assisted in thy service and like unto brilliant stars shine in these regions with the light of thy guidance. Verily, thou art the powerful, the mighty, the wise, and the seeing. Abdul Baha. Amen. Thank you, Susan. <coughs> Roll call, please, Beth. Mayor Kavanaugh? Yes. Council Member Yates? Present. Councilmember Lucet? Here. Councilmember Brown? Here. Councilmember Hanson? Here. Vice Mayor Elke? Here. And Councilmember Dickey? Here. All right. Uh, Councilwoman Dickey is on the phone. So, Ginny, um, just interrupt when you want to say something. Okay? Thank you. Okay. All right. In my report today, I have just two items that I would like they are, it's actually um, an award that the Italians received that I'd like to tell you about. Uh, the town has been notified by the Government Finance Officers Association that the comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal period ending June 30th, 2012 has been awarded the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. This is the 12th consecutive year that the town has received this recognition. The annual financial report is prepared each year by the town auditors and staff. Special recognition should be given to town accounting supervisor, Quinnell Dewey, and our town volunteer, Craig Rudolphy. Craig's expertise and commitment to excellence contributed to the professional report. Of course, overseeing the financial department is Julie Getty, Congratulations to Julie and the entire financial staff for this award. Now I have one more. Who is this guy? Do you recognize this guy? Mm -hmm. uh, Councilman Kate Elkery was recently honored by the Arizona Foundation for Vice Mayor. Vice Mayor. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Vice, just Vice Mayor. Kate Elke was recently honored by the Arizona Foundation for Legal Services and Education as one of the top 50 pro bono attorneys in Arizona. The pro bono award is given to recipients for their outstanding contributions to the legal profession by representing the spirit of equal access to justice with compassion and dedication to Arizona communities. Congratulations, Vice Mayor Elke. And to our financial staff, congratulations. All right. Okay, our first item is a scheduled public appearance uh, from Janice Strauss, Valley Metro Regional Public Transportation Authority on the transit planning study. As you can probably tell, I'm not Janet Strauss, but oh. <laughs> I'm here to introduce her. Um, if you remember, I, I was here about a few months ago. Again, my name is Darren Lozano at Valley Metro. I'm the manager for our system and service development planning. 
And here with me tonight are Janet Strauss. Janet is the project manager for this study. And we also have Scott Miller and Alec Moore. They are technical leads with uh, Valley Metro here as well. Um, so we appreciate the opportunity to come here tonight, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, we want to give you an update on what we've been up to for the last past few months. Um, you've probably seen a lot of the, hopefully some of the surveys coming about, you know, us being out in the community in a few locations, um, having one-on-one -on -one conversations. But just, just a reminder uh, about this study. Really, there were three main purposes or three main um, kind of actions we have with this study. One is to look at the existing conditions in terms of what the transit, um, um, what the transit, I guess, access is here now or what the need is. Um, secondly, is to identify options based on what those existing conditions are. And finally, uh, to provide some short-term and long-term recommendations at the end of this study. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Janet, who's going to give an update on where we're at today. Um, Madam Mayor, members of the Council, my name is Janet Strauss, and I'm here to give a project update on the Transit Planning Feasibility Study. Uh, the, one of the first tasks that we've just completed is review the existing and future conditions, uh, mostly the demographics. We studied both the census as well as the American Community Survey. Uh, we looked uh, recently at the population change from 2000 to 2010 with the census. We also examined several transportation and land use plans of Fountain Hills and neighboring communities, as well as the Maricopa Association of Governments Regional Transportation Plan. In addition to that, we also completed a community survey since we last saw you, and we will be talking a little bit about that today as well. So for our first slide, um, I'd like to highlight this is uh, for the last decade. This is actually just, wait, no, there we go. Yeah, this is from the last decade, and um, the total population of Fountain Hills grew by 11%, but in that 11%, half of the growth was actually um, people aged 65 and over. There was also a drop uh, in Fountain Hills residents of under 18 uh, residents by 10%. So that is something moving forward because quite often uh, transit markets are older folks and younger folks. So, we also looked, as I said, at the American Community Survey. Um, that's taken every five years um, as a replacement to the census long form. But the American Community Survey is very helpful because it's every five years instead of every 10. So the data that we can collect, um, such as automobile ownership, or uh, community patterns, things like that, uh, it's very helpful. But when we looked at that, that survey, we found that 78% of Fountain Hills residents mm -hmm. drive, drive, drive to work alone, and 12% of residents carpool, and there was a very small number who actually t take transit to work. This matrix, it's a little hard to see, but it describes all of the plans that we looked at, both the Fountain Hills General Plan as well as the Downtown Vision Plan area specific plan. We also looked at the Scottsdale Transportation Plan, the Maricopa County, Maricopa Association of Governments Regional Transportation Plan, the Salt River Pima, Indian Community Long Range Transportation Plan, the Fort McDowell Yavapai, Nathan Multimodal Long Range Transit Plan, um, some of those were more recent than others. Um, some interesting things to note besides, obviously, the, the Fountain Hills. Um, it's just we specifically looked at what transit recommendations were for each of these plans. That's what we really focused on. So, um, for instance, some highlights include the, the general plan that does recommend uh, expansion of transit, bicycle, and pedestrian systems as well as the um, downtown vision plan um, recommends nine specific districts. So, um, but in addition, also the Scottsdale transportation plan um, moves forward with uh, increased service frequency for Route 106 as well. Um, that being said, actually, I think that in July, the service will change from the 106 to Route 80, so it will 
Route 106 will no longer go along State Boulevard. It will actually be um, a different route, but it'll still have the same service and frequency, so it'll just be a different number there in July. But moving forward, we also did a community survey. We had an excellent response rate. We focused basically on where people would like to go and if they've used our transit system and what types of transit that they would use potentially. Uh, we also included potential destinations. Uh, we did an extensive public outreach. We distributed both in person and online. We had information tables at the community center, at Bass's and area grocery store. In addition, uh, that we were also at a booth for the Great Fair as well, trying to get input and survey feedback from folks. We also had it online, both on the Fountain Hills website and on the Valley Metro website. There are a couple of press releases and a couple of news articles as well. Um, we also uh, contacted our trip production uh, participants. Several employers in Maricopa County are actually required to participate in trip production, larger employers. So we contacted them as well to distribute the survey to their workers as well to try and get all markets as well. So the community survey, we had a great response. As I said, we had 469 responses. 84% um, of the participants actually were Fountain Hills residents, and which I think is very good. Anytime that you put any kind of survey up on the, the web, the big fear always seems to be that folks who don't live in Fountain Hills, who don't come to Fountain Hills, will actually be filling out. But we found out that that was not the case for the most part, which is very good. Um, I will note that 51% of the survey respondents are actually over the age of 61. Continuing on, the community survey, um, participants were asked if they'd ever used Valley Metro services, transit services, and that included light rail or a couple of routes or just Valley Metro transit service. And 37% said yes, a much smaller portion said that they'd used it within the last month, only 11%. But if they checked no, we asked, why they hadn't used transit. And um, one of the major um, reasons that they had is that there was no bus service in the area. I will also note, though, that um, one of the major reasons that folks don't actually use transit is because they prefer to drive. So the initial findings of the survey, 50% um, of the survey participants um, indicated that they would Consider using transit if the service was more available and more convenient. Um, now, also with the increasing age of the town's population, according to the census, it is possible that um, aging populations will require in the future more uh, specialized transportation services, such as a dial ride program or a taxi voucher program, and that is a possibility moving forward. And those are just our initial findings. Now the next step includes further survey analysis. We'll be looking at the destinations that folks said that they would like to go to, um, especially in regards to the, um, the downtown area plan and to see how those match because a lot of those medical facilities and local shopping areas are named in both, both the plan and also um, in our survey. So in addition, we will be meeting with the neighboring communities such as um, Scottsdale, et cetera, to give them the results of the survey, as well as to get any input on their future transit efforts. Um, we will also be developing prelimi preliminary recommendations for service types and associated costs of how much it would cost to put out various services. So those are our next steps, and I'm ready if you have any questions. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, most of the calls that we get to town hall are for seniors that are in need of transportation because they have to get to medical appointments or the hospital or whatever. Um, I was curious as to whether you contacted our senior services uh, director and and possibly did you did you give out surveys there to our seniors? Yes, yes. We went and sat at the community center um, for uh, several hours trying to get surveys. In addition, all the surveys were placed around um, both town hall, community center, and the library as well. We also um, produced cards that, in case they couldn't uh, fill out a paper survey, that they could go online. Okay, good. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions, Janet? 
Mayor. Uh, Councilman Lozette. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a quick question on, on one of your charts. It said 84% of your participants were Fountain Hills residents. Um, was there any way of telling whether some of the participants may have been temporary? In other words, we have a lot of, you know, snowbirds. So is that 84% include permanent as well as temporary residents? Yes. Okay. If, if, they, if they identified which community that they lived in, that's where that statistics come came from and we didn't necessarily to know if they were um, part or that's, not. That's, that's fine. And one, one other question. You mentioned 106 is, is moving to Route 80. Could you kind of clarify oh. what I didn't quite understand oh. what the difference was? Sorry about that. Basic, okay. Basically, um, Route 106 is going to, um, in July, actually be um, stopped at the Paradise Valley Community Center and in its place will be uh, Route 80, which is northern, and it will cover the same service area. It'll just be a different route. What is that service area? The, the service area, it's going to, well, currently the, the 106 extends all the way into the far west valley, and then it stops um, for some trips at the Mayo Clinic at 136th Street. So instead, the 106 will stop at Paradise Valley Community Center, but to make sure that that the Shea Boulevard is still covered, it will now be covered by Ralph Lee instead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Uh, Thank you very much for the presentation and the work thus far. Uh, based on the statistics and the metrics and, and uh, everything, are you finding that it sounds like this would be a good idea to have a route through Fountain Hills? Not going into the specifics of what corner and how many, but are you finding a need, a demand, a use? We haven't come to that conclusion yet. So, I mean, I think that there is some need there. What what type of service it is, we haven't specifically found. Mm -hmm. So. Anything else? Councilman Mizuki, do you have anything? Is she still there? I just wanted to ask uh, about estimator um, connectivity. Was there any indication that people were looking to connect to light rail or to different bus routes? One, one of the questions actually asked which transit services that they had used in the past and or which they would use, and there was a very large portion that would like to see light rail. Um, that being said, the amount of investment for light rail is very high, and it would make sense as well to perhaps do a bus route first. But there was a very large portion of folks that requested by rail. Mayor. One of the things that um, I've heard some residents talk about is is a route or some type of transportation within the town itself, not necessarily something that goes down Scott Hill, but something to get someone from the town center, maybe to the Target or Safeway or something along those lines. And I know in downtown Scottsdale you see a little trolley that goes mm -hmm. around. Is that something that's part of your study as well? Yes, we will be uh, crossing out a local circulator as well that would get folks around um, just around town, basically, um, as well as probably a, a fixed route that would extend into the regional system as well as driver ride service or a, ta or a taxi voucher program for special populations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have any estimated time of completion of the survey? Um, the, the survey is actually, I should have mentioned this earlier, it actually completed at the end of March. So, but the study itself will, should be completed sometime next year, but we will be back at regular intervals um, to update the town council. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Call for the public. Anything not on the agenda? No cards here. No. Yeah. Okay, then we'll go right on to our consent agenda. Consideration of approving the Town Council meeting minutes from April 18, 2013. Consideration of Resolution 2013-20 and IGA between Maricopa County and the Town for Animal Control Services for fiscal year 2013 to 2018. Consideration of a two-year extension of the approved utility disturbance permit for La Bella Vida at Fire Rock, formerly the retreat at Fire Rock. Consideration of a two-year extension of time to record the final plat for La Bella Vida at Fire Rock, formerly the retreat at Fire Rock. 
I get a motion to accept the consent agenda as listed? Mayor, so moved. And second. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Dickey? Aye. Vice Mayor Elke? Aye. Councilmember Luce? Aye. Councilmember Hansen? Aye. Councilmember Yates? Aye. Councilmember Brown? And Mayor Kavanaugh? Aye. Mayor 6 0. Okay, regular agenda item. The first is consideration of an agreement between the town and Summit at Crestview to release funds from Art Insurance Company for completion of infrastructure improvements in the amount of $79,577. Okay. The town members of the council, the development services director has a report regarding this agreement. Uh, good evening, Mayor and council members. This is an agreement between the town and the, uh, the Summonette Crestview Condominium Association. Um, when the uh, original builder, Odyssey Homes, uh, d developed the Summonette Crestview, um, they were required to put down a, a bond in the amount of $135,000, which is 10% of um, what is considered the work to be in the public right-of-way, although it's, it's a private gated community. So that would be the work in the roads and some landscaping and water and sewer and, and whatnot. Um, Odyssey Homes built, built the subdivision. Um, they had some punch list items left. And then they, for whatever reason, uh, walked away, went out of business, whatnot. Um, similar to what happened, they were the developer at Bolera as well. And we had a similar situation with that development. Um, we've been working with the, the town attorney, um, the HOA uh, representatives, uh, the property management company, and the president probably for the last year and a half, maybe if not two years. Um, we requested that the insurance company, Arch Insurance, um, pay out the $135,000 bond. Um, you know, it takes time for them to respond. They sent an engineer out from New Mexico to go look at the site. Um, they came back with a number of, I think, $64,000. Um, we requested the 135. Um, they started arguing that it's for the bond was for town-owned property and it's a private subdivision. So then we had that argument. Um, we went out and did our own estimates. Had the developer do estimates. Um, we requested the uh, $135,000, and ultimately Arch Insurance, after a very long time, offered up the uh, the amount before you tonight, the $79,577. Um, discussing it with the town attorney and the HOA president. The, we felt it was in the best interest to accept that money. Um, the agreement will allow the, uh, the HOA to go ahead and finish the items on the punch list, which we deem more in the common areas. Um, it's, it's more for um, sealing the roads, completion of sidewalks and handrails, um, replacing some broken concrete, some grading, some cleanup, things like that. Um, there are some items on the punch list that are individual lot specific. Uh, they use some lots just to store material. Um, we're not requiring the developer to clean those up. They'll have to clean those up before they can sell the lot. So they'll bear that cost at some point. Um, so the way this agreement works is we met with the um, there's a representative of the, of the HOA property management here tonight if you have any questions. But the way it will work is the town is controlling the $79,000. Um, the HOA president, which is also the developer, will go get the work. Well, they'll bid it out, get the work done. We'll directly pay the contractors doing the work. So, you know, we're not just handing the money over. Um, in meeting with the, the president and the property management company, they want to get going as soon as possible because we are holding up any building permits uh, in this subdivision until the items that are in this agreement are completed. So it's in the best interest of everyone, the developer and the HOA, to get these completed as soon as possible so they can either start building or selling lots to be built on. So with that, I'll answer any questions you might have. And the money is going to be distributed in increments as the, the different punch lines. Uh, yeah, yeah. so let, let's say they hire asphalt company X to go seal the roads and it's $8,000. Mm -hmm. 
they'll sub the asphalt company will submit the invoice to the HOA uh, property management. They'll send it to us. We'll go make sure the work's done, and then we'll pay the contractor directly. Okay. Any questions for Paul, um, Councilman Brown? Thank you, Mayor. Paul, when when do we expect to receive the money so we can actually start the work? We've already re received the money. Then we can, in fact, go ahead and proceed immediately, and the and the HOA is going to take care of it. Correct. Oh, uh, the developer owns the majority in the HOA, so. Good job. Councilman Lajay, you want to? Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. Paul, uh, you and I had a discussion offline about this, and I think for the benefit of some of the residents in that area, and I'm sure the HOA folks have hopefully clarified this, early on in these negotiations, there was an understanding that there was a $1 million bond posted, and there was a bit of confusion about why the settlement is only 79000 Could you kind of clarify that for their benefit? Um, correct. There were, I don't know if they were bonds, but I believe there were letters of credit. There were three. There were there was one for five hundred ninety six thousand, a second for five hundred ninety six thousand dollars, and then the one for the hundred and thirty five thousand dollars. As the majority of the work, the overall grading, the much larger portion of the project gets completed, those bonds get released when that's done. Mm -hmm. So when we're just down to the final few items, the only bond remaining is the one for the improvements in the public areas, for lack of a better term. The 135 that was negotiated to 79. Correct. And this same situation happened in Bolera, but Bolera was more built out. They had, their HOA had reserves, so they completed the punch list and then waited for the town to go back and get the money to be reimbursed. Thanks for the clarification. Mayor, okay. finally. Obviously, you went out and got some bids, and so there's enough in there. Is it or are we going to be a little short? Uh, it, you know, depends how their bids comes in, but they need to, well, they they need to finish what we have, what's in the agreement before they're going to get building permits. So if it comes up short, they're going to have to finish it. Now, if they get it cheaper, I guess that's a, that'd be a different question. Do we keep the money or do they get the money? But in, I'm sorry, yeah. but in either event, obviously the work is going to get done. Correct. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, I had met with uh, residents from Crestview, and some of them are here today, and I know that there's a speaker card. Yes, me, Carol Anderson. Mayor, council members, uh, <clears throat> I'm a Residents at Fountain Hills uh, up at the summit since September of 2008. And during that time, uh, you know, I've, there's been a lot of frustration. Uh, we've been looking at a lot of issues up there, and and, uh, and I was glad to hear some of the comments tonight that we are going to get going, and the, and, the, and the town needs to be commended for uh, for settling this bond. It's not what we wanted, but at least it's a good start. And uh, uh, I guess uh, the the one the one thing that I that I know you can't answer this, and I'm not going to put a date to it, but when we talk about soon as possible, I'm assuming that we're not talking a year down the road before work has commenced. Um, I guess I'm also concerned about one item on that punch list that, that Paul addressed, which is uh, grading the slopes behind the parking stall, uh, groom and remove piles left over from the excavation, and that's something that's not going to be done until somebody builds on that lot. That could be two years down the road. Uh, I thought that this was one of the items that was going to take, be taken care of to kind of beautify that area. Because as you drive up the gate and see this pile of dirt, and you've seen it, yes, uh, uh, it is very unsightly. So uh, I'm a little concerned about that. Uh, but I am I'm grateful that we've got to this point, and uh, um, I think we all know what needs to be done. And, I, uh, I was going to talk about a few other things, but I think my questions are already answered, so there's no sense repeating it. So, thank you very much. All right, thank you. <coughs> Any other questions on this yes, item? Yes, ma'am. I was wondering, if Paul, could you address that punch list item in terms of what what the conditions are regarding that particular um, punch list item? Do you have the exact number of the item? Yes. Yeah,
Uh, Mayor, members of the council, item 8.2 is included in the in the list. I'm sorry, did you say is or is it? Is. It is. Okay. Yeah. Now, just to point out the one, the one thing when we talk about grading, you'll go up there and 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 the way it was graded originally to pull some of those slopes back, we would have to go into hillside protection easements, which we don't want to do. So, you know, some areas may or may not be graded depending on the hillside protection easements. So doing this particular punch item doesn't depend on the lot being sold? I would have to see exactly, you know, where it is. That's There's a lot of grading items up there. Time. Yeah. That, that, you know, if that's contingent on that, then that would take even longer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Madam Mayor, I move to approve the agreement between the town and Summit at Crestview Condominium Association to release funds uh, from our insurance. In the amount of seventy nine five seventy seven. Second. Anyone else want to speak on this? No, ma'am. Any other council discussion? All right. And then all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Councilman Dickey? Aye. Okay. And seven zero. Number six, consideration of a request by Public Art Committee to accept the donated sculpture titled Blue Heron for public display at Fountain Park. Mark. Mayor Cavanaugh, members of the council. Um, before you this evening is the consideration of a piece titled the Blue Heron, and in the packet I've included some information for you. Um, Attached also is a letter from the Public Art Committee, which has been customary. Uh, it's also included, as I mentioned. Uh, joining me this evening is also has been customary is uh, the chair of the Public Art Committee, Sandy Thompson, uh, Jerry Miles, and also we are joined this evening with Jean Linder, uh, who has typically not been here, but she's joining us this evening as well. Um, this particular piece uh, presented a little bit of a challenge for us. Uh, the nature of the piece is there are uh, feathers on each side that are fairly sharp. And so the artist had recommended, and I think the group had agreed, that there needed to be a special place put where people could not get close to the item because of that risk. And so originally the group looked at potentially placing the piece on the island. At the time, uh, they also had some discussions with uh, Bill Schmidt, who you may recall is involved with the Greening Committee, and he was specifically uh, the chair of the Islands Committee. They had done a great deal of work on the islands, not only on this particular island that I will show you here in a second, but also all the islands in an attempt to uh, make them more natural at a place that uh, would attract birds uh, and uh, we would not have to continue to do the maintenance that we've done in those items, on those islands in the past. So that's the, the piece itself. Um, as you can see, it's uh, estimated to be about seven feet tall, so it's a fairly large piece. Uh, we looked at a couple of different locations. Uh, this is one that we came to grips with. Um, it is something that needs to be placed, obviously, on something that is high enough that when we get the three-foot bounce in the lake, uh, it is not going to be either underwater or significantly out of water. So uh, we looked at um, a couple of different options, finally settled on one with the uh, engineering department that we think will work. It is, in essence, placing it on a boulder, a fairly large boulder, at least four feet tall. Uh, that would take care of the bounces in the lake. So what you would see is typically the, the stage that the lake would be at. Uh, again, if it drops, it would drop below that mark rather than rise above because the intent was to keep it out of the water because of the salt content and the contact with the metal. Uh, this is the uh, uh, also a picture that uh, had been forwarded to me that shows of the potential location on the island that was discussed a little bit earlier. And then finally, um, we originally had looked at a spot that was up next to the amphitheater, had a couple of challenges. Um, because of the size of the boulder, obviously it, it's uh, fairly heavy. And so we had uh, contracted a potential vendor to see what that cost might be, and it was in the thousands of dollars to be able to uh, come here, uh, pick up the boulder, locate the boulder. Um, the other issue we ran into was the topography in that particular site. Uh, we ended up contacting the sanitary district, and they were willing to uh, let us utilize their crane. Uh, the problems we ran into is it only has a 25-foot boom and we had to have it on level ground. And as you can recall, it is anything but level when you get down, not only the access down to the amphitheater, 
but going around the side and an 25 foot extension across that new gravel area would have basically dropped it right on the edge of the liner. So um, we actually, uh, I should say, I actually uh, waded out with some waders into this particular site. Uh, and if you look at, excuse me, I did not. <laughs> Um, I did get several people ask me how the fishing was, though. Uh, um, I, I ended up uh, walking out there, and this particular uh, site is the overflow to the dam, and it actually is a road, uh, some of you may recall when the lake was drained, that it actually runs all the way out to the fountain itself, and it's approximately four feet higher than the bottom of the lake, so we pick up four feet of elevation, so it allowed us to, to shrink the size of the rock, uh, which now can uh, accommodate the uh, crane that the sanitary district has. So this is why we're recommending that particular location. It's well away from the islands. Any concerns that were raised by Mr. Schmidt associated with uh, actually repelling the birds, uh, we think has now gone away. Uh, he's aware of the change and, and certainly supports that. Um, with that, uh, the only other thing I wanted to mention is the, uh, is the insurance value. Uh, we're looking at an annual expense of uh, $43. And uh, staff is recommending not only acceptance of the piece, but also placement as depicted. Any questions for Mark? Thank you. Mark, with, the, with it being placed out, or the, the recommendation to have it placed out in the, um, in the lake there, what kind of challenges would that pose to cleaning it? Um, there will be some challenges. We probably will not be able to clean this as often as we could, but um, I think that's going to occur any place we place the piece. Um, uh, that this will not be any more difficult, I think. In fact, in some respects, maybe a little bit easier to clean in than placing it on the island. Okay. I would think that that particular piece being placed that close to the water would probably need to be cleaned a little bit more often so it's big because of the corrosive nature of the water. Um, the corrosive, well, the, the piece itself is actually a patinaed piece, okay. so that will, will certainly help that. We also went to great lengths to make sure that the water was never approaching uh, the top of the piece. So that, um, Unless it really extreme conditions, uh, there should not be a lot of water that gets on the particular piece. What we tend to get for some of the pieces is mostly uh, uh, dust and uh, uh, bird droppings. So again, this piece wouldn't be any different than any other piece. And what were the challenges that were expressed about placing it on the island? Um, the major concern that Mr. Schmidt has is that when he approached the council several years ago, they were supportive of trying to make the islands into a, a more natural and a bird sanctuary area and, and encourage by cleaning off the brush and planting more native vegetation, which has been done, uh, to encourage more birds to utilize and nest on the island. And his concern was that this would serve as a, gi a giant scarecrow. Really? Oh. Maybe it would scare the coots away. <laughs> I don't think it would discriminate between the desirable ducks and the undesirable ducks. Uh, I know that uh, Jen Miles would like to say a few words about that. He's requested a couple minutes. Thank you, Matt. The letter that you saw up there dated last February where the Public Art Committee said that they would accede to Bill Smith's recommendation that this be put in the water was based on the assumption that it would be placed around near the uh, Performing Arts Center. Uh, since that it cannot be done, the site that is over around the second one, it's around behind the Veterans Memorial is really not a not a satisfactory location at all. So the Public Art Committee right now unanimously requests that the uh, site for this piece be on the island. Now, as Mark said, there's a concern about keeping the island in its natural state, but I must point out that we're talking about a man-made bird on a man-made island in a man-made lake filled with reclaimed sewer water. So keeping that in its natural state is a little bit like trying to keep the Matterhorn at Disneyland in its natural state. <coughs> um, my experience has been that birds will be very happy. If you've ever seen a statue <coughs> in a park, the birds are not the least bit inhibited by that. In fact, I've got some marvelous pictures of birds sitting right on top of uh, General Grant in, in Washington. So. Um, our, our very strong preference for several reasons is to put this on the island. Uh, let me run through. The, first of all, this piece is, is uh, we like the piece because it's a beautiful piece. It's a piece by a local artist. <coughs> and 
Not incidentally, this local artist has agreed to give us one year to pay for it. Um, all the other pieces that we have in the pipeline uh, have been paid for, or we have sources for payment, but this one we don't. Uh, the site by the island, the island over by the Performing Arts Center, will get far, far more traffic, be far more visible, um, a lot more people will see it, a lot more people will appreciate it, and to be quite candid, it will be a lot easier to find donors for it. So, uh, on behalf of the Public Art Committee, we would request that you seriously consider letting us, or letting staff, put that piece on the island, uh, as I say, which is, uh, which is not really a natural island, uh, but it's an attractive island, and we think that this would be a very attractive addition to that island. Uh, questions or anything like that that we can add to that? Is the picture that was shown there, is that the island? That's, yeah. Uh, is there a way I can bring that picture back up? I have that trouble, too. That's right. Um, and that's uh, really right about where uh, we would like to see a place mm -hmm. uh, between two uh, swirl cactus, which uh, did not grow there naturally, and a tree which did not grow there naturally, with a bird that's not going to grow one bit more once it's put there. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Miles, Vice Mayor? Thank you. Mr. Miles, um, I know that staff had presented that there was three potential options for Mark's, in Mark's presentation. There was a third option that was discussed um, about this. Have the Public Art Committee looked at other options that are available besides the island and besides the, uh, the water that's been presented that this would potentially fit? Well, the, uh, the reason we want to put this on an island or away is the, the bird is, is beautiful, but the, uh, the feathers are are steel, and they are pointed, and they are not something that little kids can climb on. If you walk around those sculptures, very often you're going to see young children playing with those sculptures, and, and we love it. There's a there's a tortoise over by the splash park, uh, and I absolutely love it every time I turn around. There are pictures of little kids getting on there, and every now and then their mother getting on there. But this is not the kind of piece that children should play around. So it needs to be where people can see it but where young children can't come up and hug it. One other question for me. Ms. Moss, the, the first uh, location that was in sight, that was in the water, that was to be over by the, uh, the Veterans Memorial? Or no, the first place was, was the one that, uh, that was right near that, that island, but that was the one that Mark said just uh, was practically not possible because getting it there just wasn't physically feasible. So the one that they're looking at now over by Veterans Memorial um, is, uh, is a cement outcropping that goes out that uh, when the lake drops down, it's uh, really a road out to the island. Is, is the location where that was proposed that was in close proximity to this island, uh, how far is that away from this? I guess the question is, because I know it's been raised that it might act as a scarecrow or something like that <laughs> to it, was the first location that was inside the water, was that close to the island to begin with? It, could uh, it was maybe 20 feet. Okay. Councilman Hamm, this is a piece of Mark. Are there challenges getting the bird on the island? Or can you wade through the water? Can wade out there. Yeah, you'd be, you'd be able to uh, to cross onto the the, uh, the island itself. The other issue is that we obviously don't have to have the boulder, so it'd just be a concrete base like we typically use. Mm -hmm. Well, and one more thing to consider with that location is the overflow from the fountain. And I think going towards 
the Veterans Memorial, a lot of times you get the wind blowing and there's more water over that direction where I think this would have a little bit more protection from fountain water. Madam Mayor. Councilor Yates. I'm sorry, Mark. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, the, was there a study or was this just a feeling that putting it on the island would act as the scarecrow? Um, we certainly did not do a study. Um, it was the concerns that were raised by Mr. Smith, who had chaired the uh, Islands Committee of the Green Group. Okay. Mayor. Any other? Yes, Mayor. Can I... Mark. Um... <laughs> <laughs> there, I, I'm certainly not opposed to the piece of art. I, I know we're all anxious to get it out there, including the artists, and it is a fine piece of of artwork. I'm not opposed to the artwork itself. I do have concerns about placing it on the island. We have a significant amount of history around that island. We may recall that we had a sculpture donated, a wonderful sculpture, the the eagle in the nest, which is now on the avenue. That was initially talked about to go out there, and that presented the same kind of controversy from the same group of folks that we're talking about now. Um, Mr. Smith, along with several folks, um, have worked with you over the years, and they do go out there, and they do clean that up, and they do, at their own expense, um, it's my understanding, do plants and granite and so forth and so on. And they feel strongly opposed to, to having this um, heron out there. I, I get confused because we're going to use a crane to, to put the heron out there, but maybe they'll mate. Who knows? Um, so I'm 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 concerned about that group and um, the work they've done in the past and, and their expectations. Um, the notion of putting it in the water um, actually to me is pretty pretty much a novel idea, and uh, I think it presents a, a pretty interesting perspective. Um, we do have um, a tremendous amount of art in that area of the park. Um, when you get on the back side, you don't necessarily do that. And it, it, having it in the water, it's, it's, it's going to be subtle. It's not going to be obvious to the eye, and I think there's a novelty around, around that. Um, can you shed any more light on the history of that island and, and the work you've done with that group and, and why they're opposed? And it has, I think it's not so much the scarecrow aspect. It's their whole mission has been to continually... Uh, work on that island to try to get it back to its natural state as possible, although it's a man-made island and a man-made lake and a man-made environment with sewerage. Um, going back e even before my time, over 12 years ago, uh, uh, MCO had actually, before the town acquired it, had uh, run a water line out there and actually was planting flowers on this particular island. Uh, that system had deteriorated to the point that it was abandoned uh, right about the time that the late la lake liner was replaced um, in the late 90s. Um, after I came here and after the uh, water line had been abandoned, the, basically the island was left to its own devices. And over time, uh, usually about twice a year, there would be enough weeds that had grown up and it was unsightly enough that we utilized our uh, landscaping contract at the time to go to this island and the other two islands and basically cut it down to the ground again. And then uh, it would simply regenerate again during the rainy season, and again we'd be back in the fall and cutting it down again. Uh, I had approached the town manager at the time several years ago, Mr. Pickering, and suggested to him that if we really wanted to landscape the island, that we should go in and, and uh, put gravel and, and do the necessary work to make it look like any of the other landscaped areas in the park. Um, we started into that process. There were some complaints uh, that came to town hall, and so uh, we were asked to stop. And so the island really never got completely landscaped. That's why you see kind of a, a little bit of a hodgepodge. And as uh, as you mentioned, uh, Councilmember Um Mr. Schmidt came to us several years ago with a proposal to um, change the way we manage those islands. And that became uh, his uh, pitch to the council. The council was in agreement at the time to say, okay, let's turn these into natural areas. We support your efforts, Mr. Schmidt, and the rest of your committee. Uh, as you can see, a lot of those plants that are in there now are native species that, as you suggested, mm -hmm. they did plant at their own expense, and they've worked annually now on all the islands to keep them maintained. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, his, his intent is to keep them as natural as possible, 
try to attract birds only to the island, but also encourage nesting on the island. Thank you. But as far as the location in the water, though, that's the one that you're saying would be so expensive that it can't be done, right? It, it's, the it's, uh, it's the potential for putting it adjacent to the amphitheater in that cove area there. Yeah. Because if you recall, if you come down that walkway, it is probably a 10-foot drop from the top of that down to the water level. So you would, and there's, it's a great distance from that sidewalk over to even to the edge of the lake. So we only had access to through the through the uh, sanitary district a 25 foot length, and so we were not able to, we were not able to bring it far enough into the uh, to the lake to be able to make it work. So we're looking at having to contract it out, and that was very expensive. Okay, so the only choices are the island or the area by the Veterans Memorial. Yes, in my estimation, yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Councilman Dickey? Do you have any questions for Mark? Thank you, Mayor. Um, Marcy, um, Mr. Smith has, I uh, know during that time that we had discussions with him, that he is very knowledgeable about nature and um, the behavior of the birds. Um, and he um, is, is, as we said, very concerned about this. He said that uh, he feels that it undermines the efforts that he has made and scores of volunteers to keep the islands uh, as green areas. Um, he indicated that over the past three years, he's provided over $4,000 worth of irrigation, soil and plants, and volunteers have given literally hundreds of hours to weed and plant the island, uh, the latest being in November. Uh, he said that volunteers and organizations from real estate agents that they did weeding and additional planting so that they are green and look pleasing. He said that the process of design, they're in the process, sorry, of designing informational signs to inform visitors uh, to the parts of the, uh, what's there on the island, helping them to enjoy them, that there are turtles there, uh, still deer birds, and, of course, uh, live, living, great blue herons. So um, I, I, I'm more inclined to want to put it over there by the veteran uh, area also. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Councilman Young. Sorry, Terry. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Miles, could you come back up? <laughs> Thank you, sir. What is the value of this? Uh, it's, got an, a, it's got an insured value of $10,000. $10,000 that you're donating to the town? No, 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 no. We, will, we are raising the money to pay for it. But our cost will not be $10,000. I, uh, I tend to be able to talk to artists. Uh, mm -hmm. So we will end up paying $6,000 for it. And again, to reiterate, it is the art committee's um, recommendation to put it on the island. Strong recommendation. And it's the art committee who put together the whole package in order to go get the artwork to come and present to us. Um, okay. Um, obviously, my feeling about this is uh, I'm, I enjoy art and I don't intend to be an expert, but if, if an artist tells me this is what their intent was and if the group who put the package together says this is what our intent was, I, I tend to go along with that. And although I appreciate there's been time, energy, and investment in, in taking care of the island. Likewise, there's time, energy, and investment in here, and if we can't see the art, I don't think the art gets appreciated. And quite frankly, over at the, the Veterans Memorial, although it's, that's a wonderful facility as well, I don't think it's gonna get the, uh, as you point out, the visibility that it, that it would on the island. So my feeling is that I think we should go with what is recommended by the group who put the package together, and let's, let's put it on the island. Councilman Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. My recommendation is going to be that we accept the uh, donated piece tonight and we wait and spend a little more time and energy, and I'd be more than happy to assist staff in uh, pricing out a crane and pricing out whatever piece of equipment we would need to locate a boulder in the water so we could, in fact, put the heron in the water. I think it is. I think it's, it's, a, it's a very nice piece of art, and I think it's in the water is much more novel than it is on the island. I'm sorry, Jerry, but I think that is such a, a novel idea as putting it in a natural environment on a boulder. And I would, I would say we should accept this piece of art this evening and not place it this evening until we further look into the ability of placing a boulder with the bird on top of it. Madam Mayor? 
Um, Is that a motion? Not to be a motion, yes. Can I I'll get a second? second? Okay. Second. And discussion? Counseling aid? Madam Mayor, uh, Mr. McGuire, what would be the process for us to accept this today and exactly what Councilman Brown said, that how would we come to that decision where it gets placed or, or would it even need to come back to Council? <laughs> um, Madam Mayor, Councilman Yates. Uh, accepting the, the piece of art today and not deciding upon its location um, really doesn't move the ball forward at all for you because you'll have to come back to decide upon the location and the council will have to decide that. So you can certainly do so and, and if that's the way you want to go, that, that's fine. It just doesn't change the fact that you'll be back again to determine where it's going to go. Um, if, if you want to have more time to discuss it, you can either table it or you can vote to accept it with the location to be determined and then everyone can work it out between now and then. You can actually even direct that, that you know, you leave it in someone else's hands to decide, but I don't think that sounds like where you're all going at the moment. And, and this is a monetary deal. I think that uh, we need to investigate a little bit more. I, I don't see this as being a hugely extensive venture if we get, if we get the right team together to place the boulder and place the art in the water. Uh, it's something that will take a day or two to put together, and that's why I'm saying we should at least extend the offer to accept the piece of art and have a little more time to figure out if we can put it in the water or not. Uh, Vice Mayor? Thank you. Mr. Miles, can I ask you a question? Mr. Miles, if, um, if we were able to what is your opinion as far as the Public Art Committee if we were able to place it in the original place that was agreed upon by the Public Art Committee? The first if we could place it over by the, uh, by the Performing Arts Center. Uh, we thought at that point that, that we, uh, we agreed pretty much with what Dennis said. It would be a nice, novel location. It's just putting it around there back by the Veterans Memorial uh, where, as Cassie said, it's going to get all the spray that really bothered us. So um, I at least Speaking personally, and uh, Sandy, who's chair of the committee, can be safe, but at least personally, uh, to me it's a flip of a coin where if we can put it in the water over by the Performing Arts Center or on the island by the Performing Arts Center. Both are good locations, and to be blunt, I can raise money equally well in either location, but uh, um, putting it back behind the uh, Performing Arts Center, uh, behind the Veterans Memorial. Um, yeah, I'll look at each of you. Would you want to give the money to uh, pay for the piece going back there? Uh, are you Are you asking? <laughs> well, I'm asking. I'm, yeah, it's a rhetorical I, question. Yes, you, you I, I, you're, you're an attorney. You know what a rhetorical question is. Well, well, I think it, if if we can satisfy, I think it's worth I think it's worth looking into accepting the piece, and then if we can satisfy what the public art committee's original recommendation was, and we don't um, ruffle any feathers well, by, by putting it on. Ruffle line, those feathers. You're a then, very good match. Well, we've got to come back, uh, I hope, our, at the next meeting with another piece of art that I think is going to be very exciting and which has already been paid for. So I, will, we, will we have that one on the agenda for yeah, so, uh We'll be back here on another item at the uh, last meeting in, in May. And uh, if we could, if Dennis, if you can figure out a way to get that in the water over there, um, I'll have Jackie get you on both sheets. <laughs> or maybe Sandy or maybe Gene. I don't know, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> okay. Okay, and the last thing that I would be concerned about is, I mean, I'm okay with this if public art likes it in either place, is you were talking an awful lot of money, Mark, and even if we cut that down drastically, who would pay for that? Would we have yeah, to pay for problem, that relocation, be... or would public art have to pay for that? Public art is, uh, I mean, really can tell us how much we have in the... Uh, one percent fund, but I think last I saw it was about twelve hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. And uh, beyond that, all we have is the money that is uh, given to us to buy pieces of art. So yeah. uh, uh, we are not uh, we're not a really flush committee, even though we're a very active committee. Okay, so then the town would have to cover the the money. I just would want to know like how much money we're talking about. Are we really talking thousands? Or? Let's see if we can't get it donated. That'd be the goal. I, I like this idea. Donated you know? sounds good. <laughs> you know, that would be the goal. Let's, okay. let's find some people that can help us. Just set Dennis loose. Okay. You, you want to change your 
Motion? No, I'm going to leave the motion exactly where it's at. Okay. Could you repeat it, please? Yeah, absolutely. I think we should accept the piece of art tonight, and we should spend a little more time and energy trying to get a prize put on the ability of placing it in the water, as the photograph shows. And we have a second. And donate it if possible. So let's, um, all in favor? I think it's not as the photograph shows, because the photograph shows over in the other area. We're talking about next to the oh, island. Next, that's correct. Does that, does that photograph that's in the water, is that near the amphitheater? No, that's by the veterans from water. Or is that by the veterans? The one that's in the water. That's the veterans from water. That's the veterans. It's the northeast On the corner. Rock. It's the northeast corner of the lake. Correct. Right, adjacent to the amphitheater. Where the road is to go about the I just want to see it again so we're sure what we're talking I don't about. Believe that one. That's uh, by the amphitheater? No. Uh, no. The amphitheater is uh, okay. so we don't basically have all the way at the other end of the lake. So okay. if you were to go to complete opposite end of the lake where the amphitheater, there's a small little cove there. Okay. I don't have that particular one in here. That's okay. Just so we, we don't add as, as in the picture. It's basically number five up there, um, right in that okay. cove area there. Okay. Yeah, I know what that is. Okay, good. Then um, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, it's 7-0. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mark. You. And thank you, Mayor Miles. Consideration of awarding a contract to Crimson Fire Incorporated in the amount of $500,720 for a fire pumper truck. Ken, please. Our Cavanaugh members of the council, you know, there's a need to replace engine A22, which is, uh, was um, purchased in 1998 and has 120,000 miles on it. There were six vendors on uh, the request for proposal that um, responded for the fire pumper. Uh, it's recommended to award the bid to Crimson Fire, DBA Spartan um, ERV, the contractor, in the amount of $500,728.20. Um, fire Chief is here to answer any questions on the specifics about the truck. It is a recommendation to accept the low bid. Do we have any speaker cards on this? No, ma'am. All right. Any questions from council? Just a uh, uh, question for Chief, if I may. All right. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, Mayor. I know that you and your staff, um, Randy, have spent a tremendous amount of time on, on putting these bid proposals together. Um, I just wanted your opinion. Are you comfortable with, uh, after reviewing their proposal and their bid, um, are you comfortable with going with this group for a substantial purchase of this nature? Uh, we were very, uh, very pleased with all six bids. Uh, you know, the, the, the spread financially was really small for the first four, less than 25000 and the, the largest spread was 80000 And usually on these kind of bid packages, you'll get a couple of vendors that are $100,000, $150,000 difference. So we feel that these are very responsive bids. Uh, all of them are good companies that could build a truck for us or anybody else. Uh, it just so happens that uh, this company here is the one who built the one at the south end of town. Uh, there was another vendor on there that used the same chassis, the Spartan chassis. The Spartan is a large company in Detroit that makes motor homes and chassis for fire trucks. So this is really it's going to be the sister of that truck down there, and we've had that truck five years, and uh, we've had two issues with it. Both are covered under warranty. And there were minor issues, and we got the truck back the same day we took it in for repair. So uh, my answer to a short question is uh, we feel very comfortable with this company. Uh, it did take us a long time, and every time we go through this process, we learn a little bit more and become a little bit more trustworthy in engineers and that type of thing. And uh, but the big thing is we wanted to make sure we got it right for the town. And uh, we got it right for the vendors, too. And that's what took us a little bit of time. 
Thank you, Scott, and thank you, Mayor. Any other questions for the Chief? All right, can I get a motion? I have a motion, Mayor. Move to approve contract with Crimson Fire in the amount of $500,728.20 for the purchase of a new fire pumper. Second. Okay, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mayor 7 0. Consideration of Second Amendment to option and lease agreements between the town and new singular wireless for the cell tower located at 14825 North Del Convey, Four Peaks Park. Mayor Cameron, members of the council, second amendment to the option uh, lease agreement for that new singular wireless for a cell tower that, that's actually already there and are going to move it over five feet. That's uh, located in uh, Four Peaks Park, and and um, the deputy town manager would be happy to answer any questions you might have regarding this uh, agreement. Any questions for Julie? Yes. No. Yes. Okay. Can I get a motion? Move to approve the Second Amendment to option and site lease agreement between the Town of Fountain Hills and New Singular Wireless PCS LLC for the expansion of antennas and equipment at Fort Peaks Park. Yes, second. Any other council discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. She needs to tie, right? Yeah. Is that an aye? Yeah. Councilwoman Dickey? Yeah. Aye. Okay. Here, seven zero. <laughs> okay, we're good. <laughs> All right, let's see where are we uh presentation and adoption of the proposed fee schedule for the fiscal year beginning July first, two thousand thirteen. Mayor Cavanaugh, members of the council, um before you tonight the revised fee schedule for the coming fiscal year of fiscal uh, fourteen. There are a number of changes and the deputy town manager be uh Happy to answer any questions regarding any of those changes. It's a staff recommendation to top the new fee schedule. Okay, okay I just I had just a couple of discussions. Um, where it says Park Ramada, it says ten to twenty. How do you what's the difference? Is Different prices in the Ramadas, or what would be a ten dollar an hour, and what would be a twenty dollar an hour? Resident. Mayor, members of the council, each of the department directors are here to answer any questions. So Mark can answer the questions on the party. Thank you. <laughs> we actually have three different sizes of shelters. We have a small one, and then we have a medium size, and then the large one. The prices would be according. Okay. So ten, fifteen, and twenty. Okay. Um, and. What is it reduced minimum to three hours? Um, on shelter rentals mm -hmm. or park okay. Um In the past, we've charged four hours. And typically for a family picnic, uh, many of them don't utilize the whole four hours, so we are in essence charging them for that. What we've done now is put it on an hourly basis with a minimum reduced to two hours now. Oh. So it allows us not only to, to um, better meet the needs of the people, but also they're not paying for time that they're not using. Plus, we get more opportunities to open up the shelter to other groups if they want to use it. Okay. And one last question. The labor charge, there's a difference. Is, is that the difference in what they're doing or? Uh, we under the community center labor charges. The park personnel labor, it's the last one okay. for community center. Um, all we're doing there is making adjustments based on the fact that we haven't adjusted those fees upwards for a period of time. And that is uh, time and a half, typically, if they get called out on a weekend or an evening. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's to reflect right. that. Okay. Any questions from the council? Any on other speakers? No. no, I should have asked that first. Mayor? Ah, oh. oh. Councilman Dick, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I noticed that we added an, um, the Centennial Circle fee. I was wondering when you did the comparison with the other cities, was there anything similar to the median um, that we have now or when it's complete and if anybody ever had any consideration of charging fees to use that? I'm, I'm asking because I've been asked, uh, so I wondered about that. Um, I did not consider uh, imposing a fee specific to the uh, uh, to the median. Uh, my department typically hasn't maintained that that's through, through development services. Um, but if your question is specific to the 
um, fees for Centennial Circle, we did look at the existing fees that we have for um, the amphitheater. And we tried to model those fees so that uh, we weren't um, making a difference in the fees, so people would potentially choose one over the other based on lower fee. We wanted them to be comparable. Um, and so that's probably part of the reason we set up. As far as your first question, the only facility that I'm available, that I'm aware of, that might uh, provide some comparison between the amphitheater and, uh, excuse me, between the Avenue of the Fountains is the uh, facility that I believe is in Avondale, uh, adjacent to their town hall. And I know they rent out on, on occasion. So, but I, don't, I can't tell you what those fees are. I just don't know. But there is a, a public area that's adjacent to their town hall that they use for those kind of things. And of course, this is only if someone wants to exclusively rent the circle. Correct. Um, it would be for like a wedding reception or something like that. That was our intent. So they now have choices of a of a venue adjacent to. And the reason why we tried to do that was to encourage people not only to uh, have a wedding there, but also, not surprisingly, have their reception there as well. Okay. Any other questions from council? Councilman Hanson. And would that include the electricity? On yes. The yes. Okay. Um, but for the um, in the report, it just says, in some cases, particularly at the community center, discounts for extended rentals were eliminated and a consistent per hour fee is being recommended. And I didn't know if that pertained to, like, the groups that meet weekly, like Kiwanis and Rotary and... No, it does not change their status at all. Again, if those groups that typically they do book more than six times a year, they still would enjoy that reduced fee. Okay, that was and then just, I'm sorry, just Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and then at the Ramadas, I mean, I was, it, it, when we break it down per hour, we're actually, like, if we take the smallest Ramada, um, it's going from $6 to $10 an hour. If you're just, you know, not taking into consideration the, the minimum. And I didn't know if, it, I just thought maybe that was a little bit of a jump. We did do an analysis. Uh, if you look at the bottom of this particular page, we surveyed Avondale, Glendale, Gilbert, Goodyear, Mesa, Peoria, Scottsdale, and Tempe to get a feel for their fees. Uh, and these are comparable with what they charge, as well as we haven't adjusted our fees now in a couple of years. Um, yeah, I guess I did look at that, and I thought, well, most of those jurisdictions are larger. And, and I, when it comes to this is kind of a sensitive subject, as far, especially like with the community center, you know, wanting to make sure that we keep our residents feeling comfortable to come there and, and use the facility. So I, that's, it, and it happens every year, you know, that we really have to charge more. So. Mark, when was the last time that any of the fees were raised? Um, boy, I believe it's been at least a couple of years now. A couple of years. Okay. Anyone else? Um, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Mark, how are, how are the calculations made as far as the hours are concerned? Let me just give you an example. Um, with the uh, Oktoberfest, a lot of times they're set up well in advance and they've got everything fenced off in advance before the event actually starts. How are those hours calculated for those types of events? Um, well, in those particular situations, it depends on what section of the park that they would rent. And then that section of the park would be assessed. And typically it's, it's a, not only the setup for the event, but also the event itself and then the teardown at the end. Because if you think about it, that precludes anybody else from using that for that period of time. So it does typically include the, the, the setup ahead of time, the usage, and then the post use. So, so you may have a situation where a lot of times they're setting up the day before. They may not fence off the area and close it off. People can still walk around, but a lot of times you see where it's, it's shut off, you know, maybe a couple hours, maybe even a few hours before the event starts because people are, you know, working inside and they're, and they're trying to set up. Mm -hmm. So could you have a situation where you have an event that starts at 10 a.m.? But they're shutting it off at 8 a.m. They're getting charged for that 8 to 10, and then until they're, I guess, torn down as well. Typically, yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. Any other council comments? Mary, just a quick question. Thank you. Mark, do you have a sense in terms of Ramada rentals um, between in-town folks renting it versus out-of-town folks renting it? Um, Mayor Kavanaugh, Councilman Leger. Um, just a gut feeling. Um, I think because we've added a number of shelters, mm -hmm. um, I think there is uh, more usage significantly by residents than non-residents. Where you tend to get some of the larger uh, groups in here, like when we do the special events in there, sure. people who are coming for those kind of things, I think then you get a preponderance of people that are from out of town. Okay, thank you. Is 
Um, is there a MATA next to square spot? Is that one not for rent? Is, is it that is for rent. And it's, it is probably our most popular yeah. shelter. Yes. Okay. Okay. The only two that, that we don't rent are the ones that are adjacent to the playground, which is right near there. There's two on either side. Those are actually shade Ramadas. We don't use them for uh, picnics. Okay. Any other questions? If not, can I get a motion? Mayor, so moved. Uh, moved to approve the proposed fee schedule as presented for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2014. And second, please. Second. And any other council discussion? All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mayor, 7-0. All right. Thank you, Thank Mark. you. All right. Number 10 and 11, I'll read both of them because they are one staff report, but we will need a motion for each. To turn off the music, press 1. Mayor Cavanaugh, members of the council. Um, again, there's consideration for, uh, we're currently in the middle of a uh, crack ceiling um, and hopefully starting our slurry seal program in, in zone six in the next uh, week or so. Um, what we've ran into, if you've seen the pictures in your packet, that we're, the material is, um, we've ran out of material and we're gonna need to purchase some more in order to do an adequate crack ceiling. Um, operations so that slurry seal can hold and we're requesting that you uh, transfer some money from the um, uh, highway user revenue fund balance reserve for the main, um, pavement management program and in order to do that you have to uh, decrease the appropriation in special revenue funds because as an adopted maximum budget you can't go over that so we have to reduce some out to do that and Paul's um, be happy to answer any questions regarding any technical part of the of the uh, zone six and payment management program that we're currently doing. Any questions for Paul? No, no. Paul, as we've discussed, obviously the the cracks are wider and deeper. How will this affect the slurry seal, or will the uh, crack filler pretty much still do its job, even though? Sure, um, um, Mayor uh, Councilmember Yates. Um, the the additional money that we're asking for is going to be used on the on the larger cracks remaining in zone six. We're not going to be able to get to them all. Um, as an example, when we did um, Sunridge Drive two years ago, um, the cracks that were running across the road, those were filled three times before we did the slurry seal, and those cracks showed back up within a year. So it helps, but. You know, we, we're going to try to do our best and, and hope for the best, but there's a lot of cracks up there and they ended up being a lot deeper than we had thought, and it's taking a lot more material. Um, do we have any speaker cards on? No, Mayor. No, okay. Councilman Brown? Will this amount of money and material finish the job? Uh, Mayor, Councilmember Brown, it will not finish the job completely. We feel it will, it will finish the major cracks in Zone 6. Um, I'll go to the next, next photo here in a second. And, and this is a uh, Richwood um, look at, I believe, Sky Ridge looking to the west, and then the next picture is going to be looking to the east. And if you look closely, you just can't fill all those cracks. I mean, the, your your road would be all all crack seal. <clears throat> and then slurry seal doesn't tend to stick very well to crack seal, so you don't want a lot of it on your road. So we're going to focus on on the on the larger cracks. Um, that will help prevent the slurry seal from prematurely cracking. Any other questions? Yes, sir, if I may. Paul, um, we had this discussion once before down at the dog park where we had a slurry seal. We had some crack seal, we had slurry seal, and then mm -hmm. we, after the slurry seal, we had the indentation and we had some concerns from residents that it was a subpar job. Um, at that time, you mentioned that quarter of an inch is usually the standard for, for filling something. These cracks are larger than a quarter of an inch. Uh, uh, Mayor Kevin, uh, Councilmember Jay, typically the standard is if you can fit your pinky in the crack, that's what you fill. Uh, unfortunately, that 
crack goes down and, and sometimes spreads out uh-huh. underneath. So as you put crack seal in, it settles, and you can put more in, and it'll settle again. Um, so you, a lot of times you could just keep filling those things. Sure, sure. In this so, case, you're sealing the cracks. And correct. I, I, it, it prevents water from getting in them. I mean, you're filling, filling the cracks. Yeah, it'll prevent water from getting in them. Do you use, are you using a different material on the no. larger ones, or do you use the same no, material? Same material. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And I guess my, my next question is, with, with this additional material, is this going to bring the project in over budget? Um, it will, yes. So I think the budget the budget amount was eight well, eighty seven eight sixty seven it will be nine sixty seven so is this going to adversely affect um, doing doing other other work or do we have to cut back someplace uh, or are we just going to bite the bullet on this project th- this is coming out of the herf reserve balance mm-hmm. so it just lessens our reserves and the second part of this I- item is when we did the um, the repairs out on Saguaro, and we're also seeing less money coming in from the Highway Re- User Revenue Fund. Sure. So the the total 260 that's being transferred will cover this $100,000 and the projected short shortfall in the street operating budget. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Anyone else? So cool. All right. Um, I'm going to ask for a motion. I'll read the first one. Consideration of approving an amendment to the contract with Cactus Asphalt the amount of $100,000 for crack sealing as part of the fiscal year 13 pavement management program. Can I have a motion on that, please? Mayor, so moved. Second? Second. Any council discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Mayor, 6 zero. Consideration of approving a budget transfer in the amount of 250000 decreasing the appropriation in the Special Revenue Fund and increasing the expenditures in the Streets Department operating budget utilizing Highway User Revenue Fund balance reserved for the Pavement Management Program. Can I have a motion, please? Mayor, so moved. Second. And any discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Mayor, 6 zero. <coughs> We're up to item 12, discussion with possible directions to staff relating to any item including the League of Arizona Cities and Towns Weekly Legislative Bulletin or relating to any actual proposed or pending before the state legislature. Ken, do you have anything? Mayor Cavanaugh, members of the council, again, um, and, and Mayor, you could possibly help out on the uh, status of the PPT if there's any activity that was going on, on with that one. Um, and then the uh, House Bill 2404, which is... Uh, the one that's the, the Energy Act um, that they're looking to um, basically try to make a uniform or frankly circumvent um, the um, local energy uh, codes that we have for the what they call the home um, what is it, the home efficiency um, rating system and they're trying to keep it with more production home um, requirements but it has some effect on us and that's why we're monitoring 2404. Right now, it's gone back for amendments, but um, well, again, we're going to continue to watch it and monitor. And it would come down to probably a letter to the governor if it does go out of the legislature to the governor for signature. Okay. And the only update that I have on the TPC is that it is still in the Senate, and I got that report today that they're negotiating and nothing new. Anyone have anything? Mayor, if I, if I may ask, ask you a question on TPC, because sure. I know how involved you've been. In the event that this does not go in our favor, is this going to be effective FY 1314 or is a little grace period? There's a little grace period. And is that been determined? Uh, I think it's 15. 15. 15. 15. Yeah. yeah, and um, right now what we're just asking is not that it be resolved because we're not satisfied with the figures, with the, data. the accuracy of yeah. the data that's mm-hmm. come in. So we're asking for, uh, the league is asking, along with the mayors, um, for a neutral party to come in to give accurate figures. So since the legislative session is almost over, we're asking that it be postponed until next session. It's next. time to look at the figures. Next session, yeah. Mm-hmm. And there, if I may, I wanted to ask a clarification okay. from uh, our town manager on the previous item you talked about. You mentioned um, adverse effects. Um, Briefly, in a nutshell, what would be the adverse effects on that energy bill? How would it adversely affect us as a town? You, you would have to, I'm not a technical, I wish that the chief building official would be here because he's the one who's been monitoring it with his association, uh, Arizona Building Officials. Um, 
But what would happen is you have to end up rating the, you'd have to end up having to bring in another consultant to rate the house for its efficiency. And that's just another layer that we would have to require for them to come in. And I know that um, Mr. Brown could have, uh, he knows a little bit more about that because he does it um, in his business. But it's another layer of process that we're going to end up having to um, um, help enforce, I guess, to make sure that it's rated adequately. That's correct. Plus, they're trying to bring in a the energy code to where it would be uniform across the state of Arizona. And if you've ever spent a winter in Sedona or Sholo, it certainly is different than spending a winter in uh, There's different Hills, Arizona. Different and, and so it makes no sense. It, it is, it's, it's not a good bill. It's not good for the construction industry, and it's not good for Fountain Hills. They need to leave it alone. The state needs to get out of the energy business. And we've got enough codes right now to to keep our town and, and energy efficiency. Uh, in fact, Fountain Hills is probably the most strict on energy efficiency today of any of the seven communities that I build in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Ken, do you have anything else? No, okay, then uh, let's take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye.